What up, everybody? This is Fusi Tube, and you're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6. <laughs> oh, my God, you say what you do. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum everybody and that is right you heard correctly we are having Fusi Tube on the show but not right now just in a couple of minutes if you stick around. That's right welcome to another episode of the Y Factor listeners. Um, today is Thursday and we've got a really exciting episode coming up with Fusi Obviously Tube. I mean we have a <laughs> massive guest one of the biggest guests we've ever brought on. That's right um, and alhamdulillah as you all know that he's here as a part of the I Came So Far Tour with Omar Regan and Baba right. Ali who yep. we had previously on the show. So, um, And if you still haven't got your tickets snap them up quickly because they are flying out the window now uh there's not a lot of time left it's on friday so grab your tickets quickly it's going to be a massive show that's right so tomorrow night is the big event so if you've got uh you can get out of exams and you know take the family down head over to uh, i came so far tour now just quickly just for some news items uh for this week the crown prince dies aged 79 in geneva that is the crown prince of saudi arabia now you've been in geneva Aziz. yeah he died in geneva what was he doing is, is, was he like in hospital in geneva uh, he was in Swiss. It doesn't actually say why. Um, his funeral prayers were actually held on Sunday after sunset. Um, now, it's actually interesting because the way uh, anyone who actually follows Saudi politics, um, mm-hmm. you know, they know with the monarchy and they're kind of like a groom mm-hmm. the next mm-hmm. in line. So I think this is a major uh, shift to the power balance in Saudi Arabia. So we're going from like old to new. No, well, he's, he died, he was 79, so he wasn't really new, although he was the crown prince. Um, the Wait, he was the prince at 79? Yeah. He's actually the crown prince of Saudi Radio. at 79. Um, but the issue is with Saudi being a monarchy, they, they've they got the, you know, the Saud, the, the household of the Saud, with yep. who they groom up to be the next leaders. So I think, um, you know, everybody's kind of got their eye on Saudi, although I don't really think it's going to change much. You know, you had pr- President Barack Obama coming out, you know, offering his condolences and things like that. Um, of course he's going to offer his condolences to his best friend. I mean... You know, that's the way they run. But look, you know, with these kind of things, I always, every generation, they say it's a new generation. We're going to have new, different, new, I'm going to hit the microphone there. We're going to have a new, you know, era, new this, new that. I mean, if you want to look at politics in general and shift in politics, Mr. Obama came out and said, we are going to change. Yes, we can. And what did he change exactly? Not. I mean, it's interesting with this guy particularly because um, a lot of the media has been reporting that Mr. Nayef did... um, "Quote unquote crackdown on the hardline Islamists um, in 1979. He also saw, you know, the smashing of Saudi base in Al Qaeda in Saudi. So I think it's actually really interesting. I wouldn't take um, the media's the media's. Um, no, no, I'm, not, I'm quoting the media. Yeah, I'm yeah, I know. But to our opinion. listeners, yep. I would say not to take the media's um, opinion on this. Like, take it with a grain of salt, you That's know? That's right. No, Hardliners, like, well, what are you talking and about, man? In, I mean, hardliners in the context of Saudi is a contradiction in itself. Yeah, let's not yeah. go there. All right, well, other uh, other countries in the Middle East, you've got Syria. Uh, UN has actually pulled out of Syria uh, because, basically, they suspended the mission. Uh, the because it got mission. too violent. That's they, right. They thought that they're in there to stop the violence, but then it got too violent, so they left. So what, what, what were they doing there again? Basically, nothing. They did nothing. Well, it... It said it, what they did come out and said the escalation is limiting our ability to observe, verify, report, as well as assist in local dialogue. Ah, oh, okay. Projects. So the escalation has prevented them. They were there to prevent the escalation, and then the escalation prevented them from doing their jobs. So what this to me just sounds like a whole bunch of hookah puka puffery, whatever. You know, like wasting our time. They're not actually doing anything. They're not but there I, for any reason. I think, especially after the intervention that did happen in. Uh, in Libya with Gaddafi, a that lot of people different. did that not was a want military intervention. No, no, I agree with you. So you're saying, you know, but that's a difference between NATO and the United Nations. They were peacekeepers there to report. They're not there to... Well, peace, uh, define peacekeepers, keepers of the peace. They pretty much failed in keeping the peace because it's not really peaceful. I mean, now it's spilling to Lebanon. Last night, three people died in Tripoli. Mm. That's not really keeping the peace if you're mm. spilling over into other countries. I mean, you tell me, what was their point? They were there as a show 
They were there just to, so people could say, yeah, the UN is there, the UN is in Syria. Look, we've got people there. But I mean, you know, to I agree with everything you're saying, but mm. I think to a certain extent it was actually beneficial to have them there because a lot of the times people have been coming out denying the atroc- atrocities that have occurred. Mm-hmm. A True. lot of people actually denying that anything's going on in Syria. Um, and t- even the extent of massacres which have been reported by media saying that the media, you know, coverage was fabricated. But in, in so terms I think of, from that yeah. perspective it's actually kind of useful to have a neutral body there. But what, to be honest, in terms of uh, that that agreement, whether or not people that are on the, on the fence, to yep. quote them, their own things, um, be the UN wouldn't change their minds because the UN is the main source of media um, attention over there. So technically speaking, not, the UN doesn't have its own media source, doesn't have its own media. But they run. can verify deaths. So, for example, when but says, if, you know, if you're not going to trust, occurred, if you're not going to trust any media, then you're not going to trust the UN. Well, a lot of people have been, you know, hopping on about conspiracy theories and you know foreign back terrorists entering the region. Right, right. There are reports coming out. Um, you know, a lot of people questioning this. But I think the sad thing with the serious situation, it's escalated to such an extent that people are just forgetting the human tragedy. Yeah. So being lost in the And I don't think the UN the pulling out is going to help that. Well, I'm not an advocate of the UN. I mean, you know, where were they when Rwanda happened? Where mm, were they when mm, the mm, bo- mm. you know genocide in Bosnia happened? Where have they been all along? All I'm saying is I think kind of like one, you know, the silver lining, if you want to call it that, was mm. the fact that, you know, at least we're kind of getting, you know, verifying the news that's coming out of the region. I guess so. Well, speaking of the region, now, a lot of the times, like, you've got, you know, the border with Israel. Now, um, Israeli forces have apparently killed 2,300 Palestinians and injured 7,700 in Gaza over the last five years, according to the United Nations office. For the can we have those human numbers human again? Or the affairs. numbers specific? 2,300 Palestinians killed and 7,700 injured in Gaza over the last five years. So this is meant to be during peacetime. That's right. Now, 27% of the fatalities have been women and children. Mm-hmm. Um, and this and this is obviously we know that there's a blockade by land, sea and air uh, entering its sixth year. So I think that's another major issue happening in the region. Um, and... I mean, that's just, like, how is that peace? That's not peace. This, this is meant to be peace, but they've got a blockade on, they've killed 2,300 people, and they've injured so much. And Israel's how, naval how blockade has actually undermined the livelihood of three hundred, sorry, 35,000 fishermen and farmers, and they've actually lost 75,000 tonnes of produce. And this is all according to the United Nations statistics. Yeah. So I think it's reaching an extent where it's, um, it's actually become really, um, you know, touchy. Um, Beyond that, it's become like it's become a tragedy over there. You know what? The, the only thing that we we can do here over now is just continue spreading awareness. You know, um, jump on board with your students for justice in Palestine at each of your university campuses or whatnot. Because to be honest, you can't. How can you sit by silent with this happening? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How can you sit by and just watch twenty seven hundred people die f- over five years? That's yeah. ridiculous. That is. Allah Hamon, all of them. Mike, what can we say? All right. And um, finally, just in some Aussie news, uh, Gina Reinhart, um, there's a lot of controversy going on with her attempting to buy the three seats in Fairfax. Yeah, so basically, Gina Reinhart is a ma- mining magnate similar to Clive Palmer. So she's very rich. She's the richest woman in the world, I do believe. No, in Australia. In Austri- uh, I'm not sure. Anyways, either one of them. Um, and she's, she's uh, trying to buy up stakes in uh, Fairfax. And she wants specifically editorial control. Now, Wang Swan, the and her words to the uh, hire words, yep. the right to hire and fire editors to hire and fire editors. So That's she right. wants to have specific control over the the news service. Now, what does that mean? To you, to you as a listener, and to the general public, well, what that means, as Wayne Swan has put out, is that she's undermining democracy. In a very much the similar uh, similar way to how Rupert Murdoch undermines democracy in that he puts certain people in places and he takes out certain people due to their views. And this, of course, goes back to the Leverson inquiry that's happening in the UK, where they have gone all the way up to David Cameron to ask him about his relationship with Rebecca Rupert Murdoch. Murdoch. Yeah, the and the also, guy who's who's yeah. originated the idea of owning a news mm. service. I mean, it's it, you know, Swan's uh, remarks have actually been really interesting. He said, no one has so blatantly and so publicly said that they intend to impose their commercial imperatives on the essential role of journalists when they're trying to report a fair and balanced way. And obviously, when you've got the, you know, power to hire and fire editors, 
Um, You're pushing your own agenda. So mm -hmm. Gina Reinhardt, of course, is going to be aligned with the Liberals. Why is she going to be aligned with the Liberals? Is because the Liberals support the mining magnates and, you know, the business side of Australia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're always going to support them. And whereas the Labor is going to back the, mm -hmm. the, the Labourers, you know, the workers, the mm -hmm. Australian, you know, your normal average Australian citizen. So I think even beyond that, you've got the Greens coming in who's saying they want to actually introduce urgent legislation to bind um, media companies, directors, look, and board members I, to get out of editorial yeah, decisions. I, I, look, I agree with Wayne Swan, but I disagree with um, the Greens in that sense. You should not have a restriction on a journalist. A journalist should be able to spew as much... No, no, no. Crap I as I want, but they should be they should be free freedom of speech. Legislation will come in to restrict that. No, no, no. The legislation that they're proposing is to bind media company directors and board members to stay out of editorial decisions to stop them doing exactly ah, what you said. Not, it's not a binding to the actual journal. No, 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 no. That's the, that's okay. the actual point. When you've got the media magnates, or you know, in this case, it's like a media magnates. If you've got someone who's got a vested interest in a matter and right. they get to determine something as big as you know what goes on in Fairfax, then obviously, you know, the fair and balanced approach of the media is something that will become questionable. And I think, mm. um, as you mentioned, with, you know, Murdoch and the stuff happening in the UK and things like that. Well, in terms of restricting the, the board members and executives um, in in making editorial decisions, you can't really argue with that. I mean, mm. that's, that's obviously putting a massive stamp on Rupert Murdoch saying, nope, you and Gina Reinhardt and all these people stay away from journalists and their integrity. Mm. But... Obviously, politicians are going to stay away from that. Now, whatever conspiracy theory well, you have, the obvious facts are that in the UK, they are investigating the relationship between Rupert Murdoch and politicians. No, no, definitely. Um, but I think it's interesting because Communication Minister Stephen uh, Conroy... Stephen Conroy, yeah. Yeah, sorry, Stephen Conroy came out and said... Um, to Parliament that we're not going to start legislation to interfere in any way with editorial independence. But then it's ironic because yeah, that's the, you know, that's, fact that's, of the the, that's what they want. They want to stop Gina Reinhardt coming in, but they also want to not have any control over mm. editorial leadership. Yeah. Now, look, I think that the executives should not have a say in what is what is being uh, conveyed in, in their newspapers and whatnot, because an executive is going to be thinking about money. And the, the journalists are not. Now, a perfect example of this, as very separate to, journal to journalism, is in Apple. In Apple, um, when uh, Steve Jobs was alive, um, the executives, board members and, and, and whatnot, were not allowed to attend engineering meetings. So what that meant was that none of the business people, the people that run Apple as a business to make money, were allowed to attend creative decisions. Mm -hmm. They weren't allowed to be there when creative decisions were made. So that the engineers, the geniuses, whatever, they were free to do their own thing. So there's no restrictions because when an executive gets involved and when a, leadership, a business leader gets involved, their main focus is what? To make money. Mm. So at Apple, they said, no, no, wait, wait. What's working for us is to be creative, so we need to get these people out. Mm. So to apply that to journalism, you'll be, you would say that when executives um, and people like Gina Reinhart and Rupert Murdoch get involved, they will either, A, push their agenda because of the, the, the media itself is so powerful, and two, their main focus will be to make money. It will not be journalistic integrity. It will not be that I should report on this objectively and I should not report on something that is worthless. Mm. They will report more on but something that But then you've also got the sell. argument that you you can't forget that, you know, as much as we like to think journalists do also have, you know, their own personal agendas and biases. And Look, as a journalist, as a journalism student, uh, we are taught not to have to enter into a situation without bias. As a so, law student, we have our ethical things. Yeah, too, we have that as well. There's, but there's, it's, it's interesting because there's a far cry f between, you know, it's, it's, theory oh, it's and not, reality. That's right. It's not and really I think, applied. for example, just taking it back to the serious situation, a lot of the times, for example, when someone's so passionate about a cause, you know, people are claiming, for example, that, you know, over-reporting or, like, dramatising of, you know, mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. events for Look, sensationalism. you know, Fusi Chib's going to say this down in, in the next interview, but I'm going to say it as, as well. You can't please everyone. No, definitely. You just have to yeah. stick to the ethics. The ethics that we're taught is very basic ethics. You go unbiased. You go in without a premeditated, you know, concept of what you're talking about, what you're going to be doing, and you work off the facts. If journalists do that, and there are some journalists that do, and especially online journalism, mm -hmm. okay, a lot of online journalism is legit, and they do that. If you go in with a premeditated bias, so for example, it will be very difficult for me to report on Syria. I wouldn't be able to do that because, because I would be the, I would not yeah, be able yeah. to be unbiased. Well, it's interesting. Speaking of the media and bias, um, Dr. Tarek Soedan has graced our shores in the last week. He has. Right? He had, yeah, um, I went to his uh, talk on yesterday. I think it was a uh, when was it Monday? 
Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah on Monday. Monday. And, I, and I think it's been pretty inspiring, uh, mashallah. And, you know, now that it's out, um, you know, the uh, Jewish News did report on the fact that he's an anti-Semite. Um, That's right. And he did actually respond with a statement um, That's at right, his, his lecture. That's right, on Monday. That's yeah. right. So, inshallah, Miran is writing a blog post about this. So, stay, uh, you know. Can I ask you on air, like, what exactly did they accuse him of? Being an anti-Semite and based saying on, that based on what they had statements or uh, you know a sense of they've got you can Google the article it comes right. up readily yep. um, saying that he said you know the world is controlled by two huge <laughs> things you've got the, you know the Jews with money and media um, and they took it to be you know anti-Semitic um, and they said you know in his other speeches he's you know propagating this idea of Islamic state and, you know... Yes. You know, you know for example, yes. when someone has... A, again, it comes back to the agenda thing. Mm. You've got an agenda, you want to prove he's an anti-Semite. You will they're, find they're, the reasons to... They are Jewish news. Like saying, for example, Muslim news are going to always be against Israel. That's true. You, you as a human being are always going to have a, a un- like a conscious, unconscious bias. But I liked his... When he came out and he issued his statement, um, he was saying, look... Listen to what I have to say. He goes, mm. I'm not anti Jew, I'm not an anti Semite. He goes, You know, like by virtue of me being Arab, and he explained the historical connection through this, you know, um, uh, yeah. Prophet Noah um, and his son and things like that. So I think that's really interesting. So, those of you who have been following the debate, make sure you do check out um, Miran's, uh, you know, blog post that will be up about very this, soon, inshallah. inshallah. Yep, that'll be, go- that'll be it's, going it's, up. It's, um, it's interesting in terms of working on that, that idea of, you know, bias, media and bias. And then playing it into the, the Jews' hands because, like, there are conspiracies. It's always going to be conspiracies due to the fact that they that their organisations own so much of the media. I don't. It's not a conspiracy. I think people need to get over but the look, fact of the facts are the facts are lobby, there, and the that's f- their job, and they're doing their job well, and we can't. I think that's what we need to accept. The, the facts are there, though, that they do own major stakes in all the major news agencies. No, no, I mean? definitely. No one's denying the facts. But kind of bringing it back to this conspiracy and being like, oh, you know, and I'm not atta- like I'm not saying this is what uh, mm-hmm. Tariq, Dr. Tariq did because mm-hmm. he made it very clear that's not what he said. I'm talking about the general Muslim population of this whole, you know, we're always on this, like, Jewish bandwagon. That's not the case. Mm-hmm. They are a lobby, and that's the point of a lobby to actually, you know, further your cause, of right? Of course, yeah. So I think um, a lot... I mean, as, as Muslims... Us as Muslims, we've got MB. Yeah, like we've got you know our own. Yeah, no, um, we're we're not affiliated, obviously, but <laughs> no, no. no. But I yeah, we like I can understand where they come from in that sense. They're pushing their own agenda. Yeah. We're pushing our own agenda. But that's see, you'd go to Jewish News as a Jew to find Jewish news, but you wouldn't go to Fairfax or the Daily Telegraph or Sydney Morning Herald looking for biased news. You'd go there for the news in general. Do you know but what I mean? Then again, but what's happening, what Gina Reinhardt is going to do is going to make Fairfax suddenly become uh, aligned with her views. So if she's going to be firing an editor and bringing in editors, she's going to be like, okay, are you willing to propagate these views? Whether uh, they be with Mustafa, whatever? you're sounding like a conspiracy theorist. No, yeah. but th- that's what she said. She said she wants to fire Yeah, but it doesn't mean editors. that she's going to fire and hire anyone who doesn't agree with her. I think that's... Well, the... the what she's implying and what Wayne Swan has taken from that implication, not just me, it's what Wayne Swan, Wayne Swan said she's under, undermining democracy. That's a big call. Mm. That is a big call. So it's not just something I'm just coming up with. She said she wants to remove and, and, and bring in editors. She wants to have editorial control. Mm. That means, well, that, that, what that implies is that she wants to have Rupert Murdoch style control over her own little empire. Well, that's arguable, listeners. So you've heard <laughs> both of us. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Um, let us know your thoughts on Facebook, inshallah. And I think this is not an issue confined to, you know, the Muslim community by any means. It is um, a national issue. That's and right. And I think people need to discuss this, need to be aware of what's going on around mm. them. So let us know your thoughts on this. Do you agree with Mustafa that her saying, I want editorial rights means if you don't agree with me, it's my way or the highway? Or do you think that that's just a subjective thing and that can apply to anyone? Should people be free to buy up whatever they want? You know, let exactly, us know. Exactly, yeah. And and just as a final clarification in relation to the Tariq Soedan issue, be, be sure to check out his statement. Um, and he did make it very clear, as Muslims, as a community, we are not against Jews. We are not against, you know, yeah. um, we're not anti-Semites. And when we do speak of the occupation of Palestine, we speak in, you know, it, it, all the United Nations resolutions have agreed that it, it is occupation. So I think there is a very clear issue in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And there is an issue of the Jews as a faith whom we respect and, you know, Mm-mm. we... Yeah. I agree. I agree. All right. So, seriousness aside, now we're going to take it to. Yep. Now we're going to interview FutureTube. Massive right. interview. Stick around. It's going to be huge. You're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM.
first we need the love I am in the birds, I am in the trees From the brown branches to the green leaves I'm colorful, spectrum infinite I touch all, indiscriminate Breed compassion and sentiment Limitless in my power to heal the hearts of men But they're so forgetful That's why we mine on the instrumentals Assalamu alaikum everybody, we are here with probably the biggest guest we've ever had on the Y Factor, what do you think Taz? That's arguable, but since he's here, he is the biggest <laughs> guest We've got uh, Fizzy Tube, now what's your name? Uh, good day mate, my name is, uh, no, I, can't, I see my, my accent sucks, my name is Yusuf Arakat wait, so, do the, do the, wait, do the Aussie accent again? Um, I'm over here down under <laughs> <laughs> That's like a promish <laughs> accent Daniel gone wrong coming down again. <laughs> That sounds like a promish it, accent really gone bad. wrong yeah. So tell us what's the vibe been like in Sydney? Oh man, it's awesome so far, um um, it, it's crazy because it's just it's it's so clean here. I keep saying that it's just really clean compared to San Francisco. And you uh, gave me that look. Yeah, I mean, Did you just go to Lakemba and you're claiming this is clean? <laughs> oh, humba, how'd you say that? Lakemba. <laughs> Lakemba is the area we're in right but now. But she said it in like the accent. How'd you Lakemba, say it? bro. Lakemba. Yeah. Wait, Lakemba. we're gonna take you to Bankstown where they go around, speak like this. They all speak like measured. Do you guys have Habibs in where you're from, San Francisco? Do you we know have what Habib Habibis? We have a lot of guys who think they're Habibis That's looking for a wife. We don't have any Habibs. Okay, Habibis in Australia are girls. Habibs in Australia are guys. Oh really? Yep. Oh. So be careful. You might yeah, we just have a, okay. a, a culture clash here. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so wait, no Habib this here. Going back to what you said, you said that it's it's a uh, San Francisco is dirtier than Sydney. I don't want to diss my city, but here it's just it's very clean. Everyone's really nice, and everyone's like just doing their own thing, you know. And oh. it feels safe roaming the streets. You feel safe. They don't stare up my big nose or anything. Like I, don't I wish judged. you could you see our open. faces because we our drawers have dropped at this. So since uh, Mr. Fusi is here, let me just qu quick question Mr. in the hot Fusi. seat. Mr. Fusi, what would you like me to call you? It's fine. Mr. It's San Francisco? No, no, no. Mr. Fusi is fine. I'm just trying to All right. That. 10 seconds. You've got 10 seconds to answer each question. All right. Boy. Now we've got your mother here checking whether or not your answers are correct. So you can butt in hot okay, to wait, anytime. Can my mom say hello before we... Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm glad to be here watching Fusi for the first time, seeing him entertain. Yeah, this is awesome. My mom's here for the first time um, for the beautiful Sydney, Australia. All right, Fusi, I want your full name in Arabic, the like your grand, grand, great, 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 great grandfather. Go, shoot. Yusuf Salarakat. Isn't there more? That was quick. I think that's yes. he's cheating. I never knew that. You're Yusuf cheating. Salah Muhammad Salah All right. I never Age. knew that. I'm 22. Favorite color? Purple. F favorite food? Uh, uh, mashed potatoes. Favorite city? Uh, Sydney, Australia. Yay! Favorite quote? Favorite quote? Yep. I got a dollar in dream. Real brothers on my team. Everything and what it seemed. <laughs> Wait, who said that? J. Cole. Fair enough. If you can go on a dinner date with someone, who would it be? A what? Dinner date? Yep. Kendall Jenner, but she's too young and I don't want to go to jail for that. And it's the first time my mom ever heard that I like Kendall Jenner. <laughs> Khal, did you approve of that? <laughs> 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 Where don't you have Fatima? Isn't that what you say in your? Huh? Who, you know that doesn't. Yeah, Fatima, Fatima is his future. Uh, the future wife. wife. But Fatima is. If she's currently mad at me. So. Oh. oh. All right. What's your goal in life? Uh, my goal in life is to change the world one smile at a time. And what's <laughs> that? <laughs> really quiet. That. <laughs> really awkward. That was deep, dude. All right, tell me a funny joke, and it better be funny. Ah, uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not funny in person. I really can't make you laugh. All right, funniest moment that you've ever had. Funniest moment I ever had. Um, my mom coming home and catching me with uh, all her clothes on, wondering what I do when she's not at home and she's at work. <laughs> Is that what started your career? That's what started my career. All right. Wait, was, uh, that, was that on video? Was that a moment on video? Or were you just wearing it because heck, you felt like it? Um, well, I do like to wear it on Sundays just for fun when nobody's home. It just makes me they, feel they're really... They're pretty comfy, aren't they? It, it brings out a really special side to me. Because yeah. I, I, when I was born, I was actually supposed to be a girl. And when I actually was born a guy, my aunt threw up. My sister my sister threw up. My aunt left the hospital and my mom started crying. So my brothers and always used to call me Yusufina. So I think the Yusufina comes out and I like to dress up as my mom. Well, uh, I it's, it's like... wear, wear boy, Yusuf. <laughs> 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 it's your... Accept your... <laughs> Sorry. Hey, we're getting a bit touchy here. Yeah, all right, Yusuf, what's the capital of Australia? Oh, I heard this today of the old guy who was at the gym, but I forgot. We're going to deport you right now. Whoa, really? What's a Sheila? A Sheila? Yep. A Sheila is a beautiful Australian woman. Woo! <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, snap. Have you seen any kangaroos? Um, no. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, we did. We did, too. The one animal we saw at the zoo. Oh, you said we did. I thought you saw it on, like, the street. I was like, where'd you see that? <laughs> <laughs> you see <laughs> Mohammed is crying you know, from laughter in the corner there. <laughs> you see, who's, who's one person that inspires you? J. Cole. And my sister. And my mother. And my father. Are you Arab? I asked one person. 
<laughs> All right. Um, do you have a job other than entertaining people? Um, yes, I do. Where? I have to spend three hours a day on singlemuslims.com putting up a list of potential wives for my mom to approve of every night. <laughs> ah, is that paid by the hour? Um, no, it's paid um, to save me from getting a shahat to whooping at night. <laughs> Brownie points. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you've, you've passed the hot seat. If this was the citizenship test, would accept you in Australia. So, Khaltu, can you just tell us a bit about the man behind, you know, the camera? Who is Yusuf in real life? Tell us about his mornings when he has to wake up. Tell us about when you tell him off or not accept the potentials that you chuck at him. Tell us about Yusuf, the man behind the camera. Yusuf is completely different from the man behind the camera. <laughs> Yusuf is very shy, I mean very quiet. He's always in his room, closing the door, tick, 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 at most of the time. On Facebook. Thinking, <laughs> Sounds like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you. <laughs> he's a moody person and he gets so mo moody, especially when he's hungry. Like today, because he was so hungry and he, I don't know what happened to him. Suddenly he was going to sleep. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. I would say, are you okay, Yusuf? Are you okay? Yes. What happens if everything's fine? Yes. So I knew he's hungry, so I just... Khaltu, so what's your advice to all the fangirls out there that think, you know what, he's the best thing to have happened to humanity? If this is the side of Yusuf that you see, what do you want to tell his potential fangirls? No, Yusuf, Yusuf, Yusuf is an awesome, awesome... She guy. goes back to the defensive baba, <laughs> the Arab baba. They might not want to marry <laughs> no, him. No, 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 Yusuf, whoever is going to marry him is going to be very happy. He's, he's so, he cares so much. He cares about me a lot. And, you know, he can't see me, you know, sad or, or you know, silent or anything. He would just come and, and he loves to give me hugs and loves to talk, you know, and say, oh, how was your day? But you know he's a moody guy, so, yeah, so. <laughs> it's just it's, you know preparing he all the future, all the future wives. I think a lot of girls are cutting their wrists at the moment. Oh he practices them. How many times a pray a day do you pray, Yusuf? Oh. <laughs> Um, I pray five times a day, but I get reminded by my mom to pray 365 times a day. <laughs> At every time, I would say, did you pray? So until now, he's 22, and I keep reminding him every time for, for the prayer. And that's what gets him mad, too, because he said, I mean... Why are you asking? It sounds like a typical Lebanese, like Arab, you know, mum and son relationship. Uh, they're not like, Lebanese, they're Palestinian, that's get right, it right. So right, on Facebook, sorry. some of our listeners um, are asking you, do you say Shay or Shoy? Do you say Shib Shib or Shahita? Do you say Laymoun or Burtukan? Or do you say Slata or Salata? Shoy. 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 Salata. I think they're just trying to detect. Shay. 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 We say Shib Shib. We say, what did you say? Ahwe or kahwe? I know, I don't know ahwe. It doesn't matter. So where are you from in Palestine exactly? Actually, I'm from the country of the Quds, Mm. Yusuf, have you actually been back to Palestine? Yes, I have. Tell us about it. Um, I went in 1996 and I went in 2000. Um, and the only thing I can tell you that I remember, I remember climbing up the olive trees, and I also remember going to the Dead Sea with a cast on, and I had to put a bag around it, uh, because I always used to break bones and stuff, and I remember having to go to the bathroom on the bus there, and everyone crying, and a lot of screaming going on. Yeah, he was, he was crying at all time. <laughs> that trip, so. Oh, you must have been pretty young if you went. I was, I was six years old and ten years old. Ten, so you haven't been, when, like... When you've been older, as in like more recently. No, but I still act the same as I did then, so not a lot changed. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So we, we were inundated with questions from Facebook, so I'm going to ask you one of these. This one's are pretty smart, yeah? So I'm going to like prep you to ask okay. give deep answers. Okay. Okay, so one of them asks, uh, humor is a unique insight into identity, fears, aspirations, and anxieties, individual and collective. So what inspires you? How do you aim to differentiate your comedy? This is from Fariza Farma. <laughs> hey, he's giving me this look like my mom say it says again. it's a good question. While well, I'm trying to interpret anything that was just said. okay, let me say it again. I'm okay, gonna say it okay. I'm gonna say it slowly. Okay, okay. So humor is a unique. What, what am I talking about? Unique insight into identity, fears, uh -huh. aspirations, and anxieties, mm -hmm. individual and collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what inspires you? How do you aim to differentiate your comedy? 
See, I didn't get the last part, but I, I, I'm gonna, I answer the what inspires me, yeah. um, what inspires my comedy. Mm. I don't go out and go, I'm gonna do this because it's gonna make people laugh. What I do, I find my inspiration from anything that happens. So I, I, I'm the kind of director and uh, person who, I, I don't even write down a script. I'll be sitting at my khalti's house during an azime, and I'll literally see one thing happen, and that one thing will sparkle like a tree in my head, and I'll see the whole scenario play itself out. So my inspiration is from real life events, and you know, just Going into the the raw material that happens in our in our customs and in our cultures, and that's what that's inspires. But I think you can find inspiration from anything. Like if I see something on the streets, it'll it'll be a trigger point to a whole new mm. world of you know a thing that opens up in my head. Mm. Yusuf, Arab families often see humor and being Arab as don't go together, and you know they just you know like they can't take people that are humorous seriously. Wait, wait, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut in. I, I don't agree there. No, no, I'm not There's talking some about Arabs that are really funny. No, no, no. I'm talking about on like a society level, you know. Usually if you if you want to be funny or crack a joke, they kind of look at you and say, why are you being funny for, you know. Uh-huh. So in terms of that, how did you actually, how did you take it with your family? Did they accept your comedy? Uh, my family got a kick out of it. Though. I mean, the first time I showed my mom, she was laughing and she, cause she kept saying, that's not her. That's not her. <laughs> and my dad was like, that's you. That's you. And then when I made fun of my dad, my mom, my dad was like, that's not me. And my mom was like, that's you. That's you. <laughs> so I think um, the, the reason it, it, it hit home for so many people people was because it was a it was a reminiscent thing of so many families back home and so many old traditions that we have so and a lot of people you know of course are you know uh, against it and like oh what's he doing he's mocking us he's making people look at us in a negative light not understanding that we're showing everybody that look what goes down behind closed doors is exactly the same we're not the scary Mm -hmm. neighbors next door Mm -hmm. liking to kill a mockingbird we're just like you we have our you know we we live the same and you know we're beautiful just like everybody else so good reference Good references, killing Mockerbird. <laughs> so, speaking of references and education, what are you actually studying at college? Um. I'm so I stare at my mom before I answer that because I was originally a business marketing student, and then I wanted to follow my aspirations in my heart, so I actually changed to theater arts. Ah. And inshallah, when are you graduating? Um. I stare at my it's mom. It's pending. <laughs> is it pending? Yes. <laughs> um, he's, he's looking for the AMK. My, my mom is uh, hoping this coming semester, but yeah. inshallah it'll be a semester plus a winter session. Okay, so what do you want to do inshallah when you graduate from the degree? Um, I don't know where my heart lies now because I, I really um, I want to see what avenue um, this Fusi Tube experience is going to take me. So what's what's next for Fusi Tube the videos? I mean, are you going to continue exploring Arab culture? Are you going to introduce new characters? Um, where are you going with it? You see, the the thing is, it, it's kind of a dilemma mm-hmm. because, especially with so many um, people who start YouTube now, I'm not saying that I inspire them to start YouTube, which a lot I have, but uh, it's a lot of the jokes being regurgitated in the same kind of way in just a different form. Mm-hmm. So if I keep doing Arab videos, Middle Eastern videos, it's going to be, bro, you're not funny anymore. You did that already. Where people are going to be like, oh my God, that's so funny, even if it's the same joke for the hundredth time, just in a different way. Mm-hmm. So either way, it's a lose-lose situation, but um, I will never be the person who forgets what got me to where I am and I will never be the person who forgets who got me to where I am so no matter what new ventures I want to take and what new videos I will do start doing I will always do Middle Eastern videos just in a different kind of way I have a lot of new ideas just to reinvent the wheel and to keep people engaged but I also know that I'm going to start doing new kinds of videos as well which a lot of people aren't going to like and they're going to be like we want the old Fousey tube but it's it's the same Fousey tube but you know as an artist you want to grow and you want to try mm-hmm. new things That's good, I yeah. think a part of your growth uh, Yusuf is sometimes you do have your very you know hilarious funny hummus, uh you know mm-hmm. but then you've got ones that are especially sometimes on Twitter when you tweet very serious things mm-hmm. such as you know the uh, your Twitter is a bit different to your videos isn't it it's, it's a bit more personal um, you want me to answer that real quick? Uh, right. Go away. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that's the funniest thing because I get bashed on so much. Like I, a, I can a, see your replies all the time. A guy follows, like a guy will tweet me and he'll literally curse me out and be like, bro, we wanted to laugh if I told you on Twitter. And I'm over here tweeting stuff like I think I'm Socrates or something. <laughs> and I'm po- posting love tweets or stuff about, you know, very serious matters. Yeah, yeah. Because the man behind, you know, Fusu, like I, I don't see myself as a comedian. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people don't label me as a comedian because 
because that's the way I, I, I use my, my art, but there's a whole other side to me. And I do have serious videos. Like that's you what were I was just going to say. So, Sorry, um, Taz. No, it's all right. I think a lot of the times in your tweets and sometimes in your videos, the issue of the Arab Israeli conflict comes through. And as a Palestinian yourself, how do you manage to, I think sometimes, a lot of the times in the West, um, as you said, coexistence, you know, we live side by side mm. with these people. Do you think going through this journey of producing these videos, sometimes with very serious messages, has helped you kind of bridge the gaps between the Arab Israeli side, the Jewish Muslim side, or you haven't really tapped into that? Um, hmm. that uh, it's a tricky way to answer that, and because the way I tapped into it is a different way. I didn't shove it down people's throats, and I didn't, you know, sit there and go straight, you know, you know, and make them listen to what I was doing. But and the way I was doing it, I did it in a way where. There, I don't, uh, you know, any kind of religion, anybody from any kind of religion or any kind of, you know, ethnic background watches my videos and they sit there and they go, you know what? That's exactly like my parents. And they're like, and I go, but I'm Muslim. They go, exactly. And they understand that, look, we're just the same. Despite what conflicts we may have outside of this, we're all, you know, we're, we're, we're really so, 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 so similar. Um, but one thing going full on talking about it, one thing my sister said, because a lot of people actually do get mad at me for not fully advocating it and fully not talking from where I'm from and thinking that I'm ashamed to say I'm from Palestine and ashamed to say I'm Muslim. But one thing that my sister said beautifully was I'm an artist with a lot of passion and not an activist who uses art because I came into this first on as an artist and I, you know, my passion stri strives through and that's why I'm passionate about, that's why I did my Eid Mubarak reality check, reminding people like, you know, I, I, I let them have all the funny and then I reminded them it was a big, and it went straight to the heart. But I, I didn't come into this as an activist who used comedy to be able to give myself a leverage point to talk about different kinds of do you think now that you have such large clout yeah mm. I, I pointed out Mohammed there because that's his that's favorite his favorite word, word. Mm -hmm. yeah we use it in every single yeah. episode yeah, but, <laughs> yeah okay that's enough <laughs> in, enough of the clout okay so you, now that you have such a, a really large clout and a large, large audience do you think that you would uh, want to go down the activist path because of the audience you can tap into now or would you want to maintain your artistic endeavors and i think sorry just uh, for see by um activists i don't think people actually mean for example you know get out there and you know socialist and change the world and things like that sometimes for example with baba ali's messages you know he's mm -hmm. still got that funny side to him mm -hmm. but then there's like an innate message so are you trying to say that as an artist yourself you didn't go in with those you know you know, mission to kind of change the world. So you're just a, you know, artist, you're having fun. And if it happens that there's a message to be conveyed, it's conveyed. Um, if you want to answer the question, like there were two separate questions, if you want one by one. Uh, the, the, I'm I think we're having, getting him to have a midlife crisis on there. What am I doing? <laughs> the thing with that is, um, like, I want to go back to my original point where I, I'm very passionate about a lot of things, and I think my passion r rides through that, but w in terms of the messages, what people don't see is behind the videos and stuff, I also do stuff called, like, you streams and stuff. And when I first started on new streams, I would have, let's say, a thousand people watching me, expecting me to dance, belly dance for them, make them laugh. And I would sit and make like six year old, 12 years old, listen to me talk to them about real life situations. And this is this when I first started, when I was really passionate about it. And I would talk about, you know, just moral, moral lessons about how to treat your parents and what to do if your friends backbite on you and teach them through my experiences because knowing that they look up to me. So I feel like the influence that I had and what I used is it, it, it's in such a different kind of light but a lot of people don't really want to see that and they want to see one element to the stuff that I do and um uh, like even when I like I'm having my first comedy show in Sydney this Friday and at the end of the show which I promised myself and Wait, don't ruin it it's not ruining okay. it, but as a comedian, it's something you don't do. At the end of each show, when everyone wants to laugh, I stop and I, I del deliver a very strong, powerful message that really, you know, hits home hard. And just to show people, like, I'm never, you know, I, I know what I'm doing this for and my intentions are right. So I think I have my, my different ways of di and different avenues to do that. Thanks for clarifying that up because I think just in light of the tour, a lot of talk has been going around Sydney, just kind of like, who is Fuzi? What does he want to convey? And I think that's cleared a lot up. But just um, going back to that point, how do you actually, as an artist, you know, with kind of, you know, you're only 22, now you've got, you know, like the whole world, you've got 12 million views on uh, YouTube. How do you deal with this, like, newfound fame? How do you deal with, just as a human, you know, sometimes you just want to have your moments where, as you said, you know, you're moody, you know, you just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. like you just want to be yourself. How do you deal, how do you... Okay, um, 
This is going to be an ironic two-point answer because I don't mean to say this out of arrogance, but just for the YouTube thing, we uh, like yeah, Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing. We actually passed fifty million uh, total uploads. Sorry, no, sure. nah, sorry for degrading you. I said twelve. I don't mean to say that. In no, any, no, totally. Any how, how far off are you, man? It's twelve minutes. It's sorry, the Y factor <laughs> apologizes for your, not checking your facts. Your clout is a lot, your clout is a lot bigger. <laughs> I just had, I had to say that, but um, if if you're saying like, how do I handle the fame? It's actually really really funny and my mom can contest to this the one thing and i don't know why or i don't know how and i used i used to get mad at myself for this until i talked to a lot of scholars and a lot of people and they were like yusuf it's a blessing it's never got to my head and as much as people like people talk of course and what i learned is i learned two things whether you do the right thing or the wrong thing people are going to judge you regardless so you might as well do what you love and whether you change or don't no matter where you get to people are going to say that you did change i've been the same yusuf i've been you know the same person but people have said you've changed fame changed you you know it's got to your head and all this stuff but alhamdulillah for whatever reason Allah has decided to not let it get to my head not make my you know my head bigger and I've actually seen it change a lot of people right before my eyes and that's when I realized it's a blessing that it doesn't affect me at all like it's actually whenever people come up to me on the streets and say like oh my god are you Fusi Tube it's the most humbling thing that can happen rather than you know it make me be like yeah I'm Fusi Tube and I know I'm the you know what ish or whatnot. So mm, to, I mean, to, still, he still cleans his room, do his dust, <laughs> do his laundry, take the garbage down to the garage. He still do all of that even though he's he's the famous Fussy Tube. So oh, I do agree. Um you say um Fussy Tube. I was just gonna, <laughs> I was just gonna ask you the same thing. As a mother, you know, seeing your son go through this journey, um, and obviously he's very, very passionate about what he does. When you hear people kind of, you know, say things or criticize things, what do you have to say as a mother? as a mother looking you know to your son who's an, an artist now well thank god yusuf knows that he can't be loved by, uh, by everybody you know you, you should have somebody who doesn't like you or doesn't like the way you talk mm. or you know who you are so it's it's and he knows it very well so w even when he says you know i i receive a criticism or you know i had some i hate a uh, message or anything i said it's okay you can't please everybody, so it's fine. That's beautiful. I think we're getting a bit serious now, and that's so we unnatural. Have, I, think I think the air in the studio is just getting a bit, you know. People are expecting. So, like Fizzy, just tell us, tell us some stuff about Australia. So, what have your impressions been thus far? I know, you know, the Tar has have taken you shopping. You've been hanging out with to Robbie, the gym. We didn't, we didn't go to shopping yet. Oh, you haven't gone oh, shopping I yet. Do. You haven't been. No, we haven't. Oh. We oh, don't, will, don't mention the shopping we will, center. We, will, please. we don't want a roadblock. I thought what? It's urgency. I thought Rabbi. I thought Rabbi took him. Didn't he take him? He's going to. He's going, going to. We're going. Do you know where you where, where do you want to go shopping? Um, I, I don't know, but the, the thing that I realized here, and I don't mean to, I'm not saying this in a bad way to Australia, but the prices here are so insane. Like high? Yeah. Really? Uh, we yeah, but the Aussie dollar is high. We, so you're but we went into a pastry shop and there was a cake for forty five dollars, and for forty five dollars in the state, I can buy a kitchen and bake a cake inside it. So. What? And a free really wife as a bonus. <laughs> because you don't bake, you wouldn't know. It's mad. It's there, mad. There's no cake for forty five dollars, and it's just the prices were. You think insane. that's bad? I've, I've had the cake one hundred and twenty dollars. Oh my god! Huh? Hundred and twenty dollars cake for a cake. For a cake. Um, Fussy, is disagreeing. Can I am you I'm disagreeing. There's a forty five dollars cake, and there's fifty dollars cake. It's, you never bought a cake for me. <laughs> 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 I think, I think there's a need now. Time, you know. <laughs> is this, is this he's, he's not in, like, you know, the kitchen or cooking time, you know. So that's why he always have everything ready for him to be served. <laughs> <laughs> he had to have everything by himself. So he was surprised today because he never goes shopping for, you know, for cake or anything. You know, Mama you does everything. So I saw, what do you know? I, to the fan I girls, some, take note. I saw some cl uh, clothing prices too, and it was extremely yeah. high. Oh, no, me. I agree with you there. Uh, change I, the topic, change the topic. But yeah. back to the kitchen, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you obviously have to go to the kitchen to record your, you know, your hummus dance. You know, you yeah. had the Ramadan one where you're like, you know, you and your dad in the kitchen yeah. eating the whole thing. That was the most epic video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, when with different parts of your house, uh -huh. have you actually turned them into filming zones? Um, it's the whole house. There's no restrictions except for the dining room, which I have crossed over. Yeah. Into. <laughs> have you? Yeah. I, I think the danger. Yeah, the yeah. stick is still there. The danger one. That was one of my favorites. Best. We. It, it. There's. There's no restrictions. It's everywhere in the house. The house is my. You know, my battle zone. 
that'll yeah. Well, all right. So while I'm, uh, while I'm at work, actually, you know, my house is turned upside down. And she hates it. And what's so funny is I'll be shooting, and my dad, bless his soul, doesn't understand the the <laughs> art of you know no background noise or anything. So we'll be in a mid scene, and my dad will go turn on the TV, put on volume 45, go to the stove, open the thing, call his friend <laughs> while this is all going on, and I'm like, you know, we just stare and stare at him, and he doesn't know anything that goes on. <laughs> Literally, he grabs his chobis, he grabs his goat cheese, and he sits on the couch and has nothing, no idea what's going on. I think that's material for another video right there. <laughs> Firstly, you were at the zoo today. Tell us about the animals oh, in Australia. Man. What was that like? Oh, wow, there were so <laughs> many. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to diss your zoos, but we went um, we went at a prime hour where um, they were, I think, on vacation, just like we were. Who took care of Ravi. A Kareem. Bless their souls. Yeah, apparently they took him when uh, all the animals were asleep. We, we weren't supposed to Australians say that. Australians are laid see. back. Even <laughs> our animals are laid back. Even we like to I mean, chill. We like that's, to that's relax. That's like all day. You yeah. know? They're all sleep all day sleeping. That's that's for us. That's important. Like we I, we need them to sleep. I didn't know that you guys had Tasmanian devils. I thought that was just a TV show. So it was cool to see that. Well, we but did. we didn't see them. We, have, we, but we have. heard that you guys had. Wow, them. We, they're actually I didn't, I didn't extinct. <laughs> yeah, Tasmanian devils are. We read the sign, but we didn't see them. So we saw. That's disappointing. You could have read the sign over. Says, I think you deserve hey, you another trip me. to the zoo. Why are you looking at things that are already extinct? <laughs> yeah, no, me and and, and Robert, we did see we did see that Tasmania was was crawling and and sleeping. Oh, okay. You you me and Karim. Yeah, you, you were you and Robert were on the phone. Okay. Yeah. Ah, typical of Robbie being on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Did you see any koalas? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, they're cute, aren't they? But they're always sleeping, so don't don't feel like you missed no, out. They, they, they were, you know, They were sleeping playing. on a tree. No, they, one of them, there was acting in front of the girl. No, they were fine. <laughs> acting in front of the girls, you'd know. <laughs> so tell us, do you feel like a koala sometimes, acting in front of the girls? Uh, definitely, I don't think so. <laughs> All right, um, any final, you know, remarks or reminiscences or whatever you have about Australia? Wait, you, you want, do you have, do you have, wait, wait, before, before we continue. Continue. Do you have anything you, anything you want to see? Like, do you have something in your head that you want to go and see? The Opera House in Harbour Bridge, whatever. Anything that I want to see? Um, have you been to Bondi yet? No, I haven't. I, I mean, it's a bit go. cold. You don't want to go. It's not even the best beach. Um, I, I think what I want to see... You mean all of Australia or Sydney? All of Australia. All of Australia. Um, a cliche answer, very cliche answer. I want to see um, all my Fusi Tubians who live out here because I'm, I live on the other side Aww. of the world. So the fact that I get to see you guys and interact with you guys is awesome. Aww. So. Aww, he's so cute. <laughs> 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 of course, Mama laughs at me. <laughs> so, other than the human attractions in Australia, anything else you'd like to see? He obviously doesn't want to spend money anymore because he found that was so expensive. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I don't know much that's out here. I'm sure they're gonna. They're, they've been showing us a lot though. Like they're gonna take us to uh, the Blue something Blue mountains, mountains. Some Blue Mountains tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow, if you're listening to this today. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, well, well. They, they're, they're showing us around everywhere, so yeah, it's going to be cool. They did a good job, and you know, they, they, they did their best today. I yeah. think it's a husband. They know that the animals will attack. Uh, my, my dad picked it around. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a hospitality thing, and I think, you know, that's another they, thing they, that comes out. They all out. feed them at a certain time, so when they they eat, they go to sleep. Yeah. They're like a cat, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I told Ravi he couldn't take care of men. men. No, what? Yeah. no they, they did a great job. And actually, you just said hospitality. Everyone has been so hospitable here. I hope that's a word. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. Everyone's been very kind and treating. The only reason I have, they're treating my mom beautifully. So it's really cool. Wait, I have another thing. Is there a food that you can't wait to try out here in Australia? Anything but Vegemite. Ve oh! oh! No, no, before, wait, 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 before, before we get to the Vegemite before. challenge. That, reminds, us, that reminds me. Uh, Yusuf, you did say that you like to conclude things with a powerful message. So before we conclude with our powerful message, uh, Fiasco from the Y Factor. Mm -hmm. A we powerful like, spoonful of Vegemite. Don't ruin the surprise, but before we do that, you, Yusuf, anything you'd like to say to the youth of Sydney um, who I think, you know, being in the West the youth, sh youth shares similar issues with, you know, kind of, you know, identity, not knowing who they are, mm -hmm. wanting to pursue something with their parents, shoving something down, you know, something mm -hmm. else down their faces. What's just, you know, advice to the youth? Well, I, I want to give something that's different than what I'm going to say on um, after the event. So I think what I want to say here is. Um, a very cliche answer to the youth, but something that helped me in my life. Um, and my sister taught me this as well. When you you guys are very young right now, and you're looking for what to do in life, so when I say follow your heart and follow your dreams, I really want you to understand that 
anything and everything is possible because I sat in my bedroom um, in to, uh, 2011 and I talked to the camera and I told everybody I want to go to Canada and I want to go and I want to go to Australia and it was a shot in the dark and I also said stuff like the Ellen Show and a whole bunch of things like that being very naive in my bedroom saying that and Alhamdulillah through hard work perseverance and truly 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 believing that it would happen I am now sitting here in Sydney and did exactly what I wanted to do so if there's anything you want to do I would say follow your heart and there's nobody nobody no, like nothing that can get in your way except for the person you see in the mirror and Allah above so just follow your heart follow your dreams and do what you want to do so I know your parents might want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or something but understand that you're living your life for yourself and I just follow your dreams and my sister even told me um, the the big the best thing in life is what you wanted to do when you were younger and that's what she learned too so follow that and you're gonna be happy don't follow the money follow what makes you happy I'm gonna be ballet dancer I've always wanted to do all right Rashwani <laughs> all right all right so how to um, um Fusi tube anything else you'd like to say as a concluding remark well I'm really really happy you know being here and be uh, seeing such a very nice and um, uh, generous people around me I didn't expect it actually I was you know going to s go just hire somebody to to go sightseeing <laughs> and, and leave you Yusuf mm. with his work and everything but I was surprised that you know everything was planned everything was organized Thank you to Majid, to Rabia, to Kareem, and so much, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm so excited to see Yusuf for the first time, live entertainment, because I he invited me so much for other events I didn't have time to. But this time, you know, I'm, it's I'm, Australian ready, exception. I'm ready to go and yeah. So and Khalto, what are you going to do if uh, Fusi goes to the Harbour Bridge and meets an Australian girl? Are you going to, are you okay with that? No, he knows the rules. <laughs> <laughs> You said just look down. And like, oh yes. Uh, one thing I'm um, backing off of my mom said, and uh, the reason I love that I'm in Sydney so much, and uh, this is the first time like my mom is seeing what I have done with my life and how far I've gotten, and it's called the I Came So Far tour. So I think the most gratifying moment of this experience, even if she knows it or not, because you know she said I'm a moody person and everything, but it's gonna be <laughs> seeing her, you know, while I'm on stage, and also we might have a surprise, but it's just gonna be, it's it's Ooh. a very gratifying moment and something I'm very excited so for. So it's a doubly important event. First time in Australia, first time your mum is seeing you. Oh yeah, it's huge, it's huge. Double I might get whammy. emotional that night. All right, speaking of emotions and mm. anger and fear and all the rest of it, you've heard about Vegemite. As we said, it's a staple to Australia. It's our hummus, right? So what we need you to do is, as a part of um, our hospitable Australian uh, welcome to you, we want you to eat a spoonful of Vegemite on air, right? Now, trust me, it's Look, very I'm gonna, nutritious. I'm going to be very honest with our audience. I, I don't like this, and I've never had it before. So, like, um, can you not ruin it? All oh, right. How, how is this is a spoonful, a spoonful yeah, of Vegemite on air. You can do it. Have you tried? <laughs> it's, hey, it, it's what so doesn't kill you only makes you. Smell it, smell it, smell it. It's so funny that she said it's okay because we were eating today and. Um, I think she's taking it back. She smelt it. <laughs> <laughs> today, ro today, today, Robbie ordered broccoli and stuff, and then there was something on the plate, and he asked her what it was, and she told us it was fungus. Fungus. So the fact that my mom says this is okay. But mushrooms are fungus. But <laughs> okay, Lucy, okay, remember, stick to your advice. What doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, smell I smelt it. Okay, don't smell it and just put it and swallow. And there's water here. She's giving him. She's okay. Come on. That's that's it, he's it, he's, 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 he's having a lot of regrets. That's huge. They're worth ten dollars. <laughs> this is bigger than the cinnamon challenge. This is oh, bigger than the cinnamon challenge. Here we go. It's not even falling off the screen. If I throw up, I'm dead. We're on air. We're on air. Ready, Come one, on. two, three. He put it in his mouth. He's having it. He's chewing it. Oh. Nom, 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 nom. Here we go. Oh, he's locked his nose. <laughs> he wants to vomit. No water. Deliberately no water. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, there really is no water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, is he's drinking a lot of water now. He needs to <laughs> spit it out. You're not going anywhere. Why would I do this? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you said... <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> I don't know why I would do this on air if it's uh. <laughs> to the listeners. It, it, it's, ooh, to the it's, listeners it's, that are hearing us on radio, this video will go on air. <laughs> We're uploading okay? this video. Wait, are you okay? Last message to everybody: Do not try Vegemite ever. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, yes, you do. Yes, say yes. yes, that can be it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, because we're such nice, hospitable people, we got you chocolate to balance oh, it out. It's a part you. of the Osby hospitality. Yeah, he wants to stick it in his mouth quickly so that he oh can get rid of the goodness. taste. All right, Fussy, any from the Y Factor, would like to thank you immensely for coming on our show. It's honestly been one of the best um, interviews we've had. So we'd like to thank you for coming all the way to Khaltu Umfusi. Thank you so much for being here. We hope to see you again soon because uh, we loved having you here. We're probably going to love you on Friday night. And uh, all that's the right. Shows to, the, to the to uh, the Fusi fans, if you do want to see him, catch him on Friday night at the um, I, I came so far, far event. Inshallah. Mm-hmm. Um, and are you've got where tickets? are you going after we, Sydney? We still have tickets going. Are there around 100 tickets go? I really, uh, yeah, everybody come out to the Sydney event. It's, it's actually going to be the largest OMF tour and I came so far tour event of all time that I've been at. So it's going to be a huge crowd. It's going to be a whole bunch of fun. And then we're going to Melbourne and then we're going to Brisbane right after. So I hope you guys can make it out. And just we're giving you words of advice Sydney is the best. So don't, ex- don't have high expectations oh, yeah, of yeah, Melbourne yeah, yeah. or it Brisbane. Gets, it gets worse from here on It in. does. Yeah. So this was the climax, all right? Thank you so you much, Fussy. And exactly. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I love being down under. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, we need to smile at each other Reach for your brother Help one another All we need is love Smile at each other Reach for your brother Help one another All we need is love Joining me in the studio today is Sister Yellies, who is a volunteer with the Orphan World Fund. Welcome to the show, Sister. Um, Salaamu Alaikum, Sister. So we've heard a lot about this um, World Orphan Fund. I remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, Rashwani at uni, did you see those um, letters, a letter to the orphan? There was a letter to the orphan. I think they did a soccer gala day as well and a couple of other things. They've done a lot of good work. So w- what is this um, you know, Orphan uh, World Fund? Okay, excellent. So um, World Orphan Fund Incorporated is actually an Australian non-government organisation and an international strategic aid organisation. Um, We focus on on orphans. Some of the campaigns that you've just um, mentioned just then is actually the local campaigns that we've run in Australia. Um, However, at the moment, I mean, our focus is on orphans, but at the moment we're concentrated on Southeast Asia. Um, I might just quickly point out that as an aid organisation, we our values are 100% volunteer based and 100% mm, donation. So, is it just is the organisation just based in Australia, or do you have other offices? No, just Australia. Oh wow! Oh, so mm-hmm. we're like the first country that you have started out in. That's exactly oh, right. Are we yeah. first and it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's named the World Orphan Fund. Does that mean your efforts for charitable activities are focused on orphans? That's correct. Yes, we do help communities as well when we go into you know the villages where the orphans are however like i said yeah our focus is definitely orphans and what are some of the programs you've actually offered to these orphans um okay so we have uh, run some development projects there so we actually have an orphanage appeal at the moment uh, we've done Zekat Appeal. Every year we run a tier appeal. Um, we've got orphan sponsorships and there is over 100 um, orphans waiting to be sponsored. And uh, we do hold Iftar for orphans and also Sadaka as well. So, wow, mashallah. Yeah. So what countries do you like aim at? Like what are the specific countries that you're doing this in? Okay, so like I said, at the moment, our focus is Southeast Asia only because it is the closest to Australia, um, as we're Australia-based. We are trying to get to the closest, I guess, uh, countries that we can get to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, In having said that, uh, in a week's time, we are actually travelling to Turkey. Um, We've got some projects there. I'm going to cut in. I'm really sorry about that. But is that where Mohsen is going? Yes, that's right. Because I just got a call from him right now. Any shameless plug for his friends, but back to the organisation. Because, no, no, I got a Cool. And he's like, we have to meet up because I'm going to Turkey like next week. Like, Where are you going to Turkey for? Okay, That's well, this right. is really interesting. The mm. fact that volunteers actually get to go and uh, yep. is this helping distribute the actual um, funds as well as uh, part taking programs? Is what's, what's we happening? actually have been invited to a conference um, mm. in Turkey, and we we will also be taken um, by one of the biggest aid organisations in the world um, to actually the Syrian border. So we're going to actually oh, wow. go to the refugee camp there and visit the orphans then. Inshallah, we actually want to run projects there as well. So we've got big hands in our pockets. <laughs> this sounds really exciting. Yeah. How long has uh, the World Orphan Fund been running? Um, we've actually been working on World Orphan Funds for the past two years. So we are, um, alhamdulillah, we, we've been very humble. So we have stayed quiet. Um, but we have grown rapidly, so... And yeah, two years pretty world. quick to be going so out to... So, you did stuff. mention Southeast Asia. What country specifically? And um, are these aimed at, for example, you know, the region is often, um, you know... Uh, 
targeted, with, you know, natural disasters and things like that. Yep. So is it, you know, like a crisis emergency thing or no, a development? No, um, that's why... Um, at the beginning, when I was saying international uh, strategic aid organisation, we actually want to go in and build community. So uh, we don't want to just go, uh, I guess... Band-aid we don't op- solutions. Exactly, yep, exactly. Yep, yep. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we just go there and we actually um, cre- try to create jobs for people. We put children in school. Um, we um, ensure Islamic education as mm. well. We have put orphans into university as well. So we want these people to actually um, give back to their communities. Wow. So, so, so self- And in terms of if you want to work or if you want to pay like charity to this committee, mm-hmm. where, where would you have to go? What would you have to do? Um, if you so if you wanted to help out, if you wanted to okay. pay or if you for wanted to... For World Dolphin Fund? Yep. Okay. So I would say um, get in contact with our volunteers. You can actually visit our Facebook page as well. Um, and we do have an email address, which is info at orphan.org.au. So mm. you can email us also. Well, speaking of um, events and volunteers, you actually have an event coming up this Saturday, which is the 23rd of June, 11.30am mm-hmm. till 3.30pm. Now, inshallah, it will be located in Guildford. Yep. Uh, it's a sisters only event. Um, and a it's sisters the, only event? What? Uh, Mohsen, kind of I mean, <laughs> Mustafa. Mohsen as well. Come on, man. That's like a double blow. <laughs> All right. So, sister, what's this Orphan Awareness Day about? Okay. Um, just before I get into the event, there's one more thing that is very important that I want to mention about uh, World Orphan Fund is that we are 100%. Um, we do have a 100% donation policy. So it's zero administration fees. So if you were to, you know, give us, let's say, $20 to take to the orphans, that orphan receives that $20. And when we travel or go anywhere, we actually pay out of pocket. Mm, inshallah. Um, yeah, inshallah. So um, in regards to, in terms of the Orphan Awareness Day event, um, it is, um, as you mentioned, a sisters only event. The purpose of the event is um, to create awareness of orphans all around the world. Um, there will be a beautiful program. Um, there will be children volunteers um, reading poems, short stories. Um, there will be a very little special guest, um, an award-winning guest in Sydney, um, singing nasheeds to us. She's absolutely beautiful. There will be um, a sister giving us a speech. Uh, she's an amazing sister, so I'm looking forward to that myself. Um, other than that, there will actually be stalls. Um, and so everyone will be, you know, shopping, having a bit of fun and, inshallah, um, getting the Hassan for it as well. So. Okay, so what's the address, inshallah? It's in Guildford on Mount Ford Street, so 64 Mount Ford Street, sorry, Road, yep. <laughs> 64 Mount Ford Road in Guildford. And, again, that's the 23rd of June from 11.30 a.m. till 3.30 p.m. Yep. Unfortunately for um, Mustafa and his gang, it's sisters <laughs> only. Um, so if you are interested, inshallah, you can uh, email, as she said, info at orphan.org.au. We should do and brothers Day then, straight out. We should just like why ban you guys from helping us. <laughs> this is an event about the orphans. We're not getting into. Brother I know it's not debates. a competition, but you know, like. <laughs> Sister Yelis, delighted to have you on the show today. May Allah reward you, and inshallah, we all look to forward to seeing you guys on Saturday. Also, if someone's just interested in actually getting involved with this organisation, mm-hmm. where should they go? Um, they should actually contact us through our Facebook page at this stage. Um, all of our contact details, telephone numbers, everything is there. So World Orphan Fund on Facebook, please like us. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. And my Allah reward you for coming in today. Just like Allah. Okay. So, all right. All right, guys. So thank you so much. That brings us to the another end of an awesome episode. Crazy episode. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> the video tube um, clip of him actually uh, eating the, the video Vegemite. Tube. Did I say video tube? The video tube. Oh. The video of Fusi Tube taking a bite of that Vegemite will be up very soon. That's right. And also, don't miss on the uh, miss out on the event, inshallah. That's this Saturday by the uh, Orphan. Friday. Oh, uh, the Saturday, the Saturday, Saturday event. And Friday there's an event. I came so far on Friday. Yeah, but I'm talking about the Orphan World okay, Trust. Okay, all right. She's giving me <laughs> massive dirties. The Orphan World Trust is Saturday morning. And as we mentioned on last week's uh, episode, inshallah, uh, Saturday afternoon, inshallah, we will be having uh, Mahbub's Promise, right? Um, and that's another fundraising inshallah. dinner for the orphans of uh, Afghanistan. So if you're interested, two events for the uh, for a worthy cause on Saturday. And don't forget, buy up your tickets, go to Fusi Tube. It's going to be hilarious. It's going to be great fun. Um, and there's another event for Fusi Tube as well. It's going to be at UTS on uh, July 1st which is the, sun- the next Sunday snap up your tickets for that if you miss out on I came so far alright thank you so much you're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM Assalamu Alaikum